Hello. On this video, I'm going to discuss explicit and systematic instruction and the components associated with that technique. But before I get started, I want to remind everyone viewing this video that the slides that, that I'll be using are available on the G Georgia Department of Education website. Now, as we move into this explicit and systematic instruction, most of us should know by now that the National Mathematics Advisory Panel final report has been released and within that report they specifically address instructional practices in kids who struggle. Within that report they make several recommendations, one of which is that teachers must provide explicit methods of instruction on a regular basis to kids who struggle. And when I'm referring to kids who struggle, I'm talking about that subgroup or subgroups of kids that are traditionally low achievers or specifically have problems in math and of course kids with learning disabilities. But within that, that recommendation, they, they clearly delineate explicit methods of instruction should be made available. There should be clear problem solving models. They should use carefully orchestrated examples to sort of sequence and, and demonstrate what it is the students are trying to learn. Whenever possible, use concrete models to demonstrate abstract concepts and make those links as carefully as possible, as well as allowing kids to engage in thinking aloud about certain problems. So that the report has come out and that these are the recommendations for kids who are struggling. What I want to talk about is go into more detail about explicit instruction and sort of what that is or what that looks like for the classroom teachers that are out there viewing this. Now, what the report really tried to talk about is this idea of uh, explicit and implicit. And I just want to take a quick second or two to, to talk about this because this is very important. And this has been conflicting, or, or I shouldn't say conflicting, but competing views out there in the field about how we teach math in that many view that a more student-centered approach where the teacher is more the facilitator to guide the students in the process of learning. And then there's teacher-directed where we want to have students, the teacher direct, directly teach the students. But what you have to think about is more of a continuum or a progression. Then when we're talking about the subgroup of kids with disabilities and kids who struggle, they have problems when they approach math problems and they have difficulty solving them. So in this appro approach or this sort of continuum or progression, initially we must start off in more of an explicit instructional approach to fill in the gaps, fill in the pre-skills, the prior knowledge, the vocabulary, the procedures, con concepts, and so forth to get the kids to a point where then, then they're able to be more implicit in how they solve a problem. But it's very, very clear with the research is that kids who struggle initially in learning math concepts need a higher level of explicitness. So with that being said, I want to talk directly to the classroom teacher as to what that actually looks like in the classroom. Well, we're talking about making instructional content explicit. And what that means is we are very clear and accurate in our examples and demonstration of what it is we're trying to communicate. And if you sort of think back into your, your lives outside of education, you've I'm sure come across individuals that could just teach you just about anything. They were able to take whatever it is that they were trying to teach you and communicate it to you in a way that you were able to understand it. And generally speaking, characteristics of that individual is that they're clear they're accurate in what they're talking about and they're able to give very rich robust examples and demonstrations to what you're trying to do another characteristic of effective teachers and in explicit instruction is they're 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 able to define the skill of that particular lesson and make it very clear to that student what it is that they're trying to learn and then finally what is really an important aspect of explicit instruction is the ability to present it or teach it in small steps. We have to remember, kids with learning disabilities and kids who are struggling, that they, they are having problems in math. And it is advantageous or effective to break it down into smaller steps in the initial instruction and then eventually build it and put it back together in the end. So within explicit instruction, and, and you'll be able to see from the slides, there are six components. Now, 
the slides provide a great deal of information that you can take a look at. I'm sort of going to highlight the, the major points of each of these slides, but there's six critical features with, uh, involved with ex explicit instruction, which what you'll see goes far be beyond teacher lecture. And this is something I want to make very clear. Explicit instruction is not a teacher lecturing. It involves much more than just teacher lecture. But within these six characteristics, I'm going to go over and highlight the important components of each one of these, and you have the slides to reference uh, for more detail. But within this, what's very important is this aspect of a daily review. And uh, effective math teachers will start off with a daily review for a couple reasons. Number one, it is a good way to activate prior knowledge, or in some cases, fill in that prior knowledge that the kids don't have. This can be done through various techniques, homework, um, connecting previously learning things, and what is even more important is this idea of prerequisite skills. And in mathematics, it's so foundational that when kids are missing certain prerequisite skills, that makes it very challenging for them to move forward. So a daily review is a very, very important aspect of math instruction from an explicit standpoint. Within that, we then have the presentation of the content, and this should make up the bulk of the, of the time, instructional time. But within this uh, explicit instruction, the content you know, needs to be presented explicitly. In other words, the, teacher, the students need to be directly taught the steps, the concepts, the skills of what it is they're, they're, they're addressing. It's also helpful at this stage to provide some structured notes for kids. Teachers should also be frequently checking for understanding. Any new procedures need to be explicitly modeled for the student. And another highlight, which I'll talk in another video, is the idea of using very clear and consistent mathematically appropriate language. And that's something that is very, very important that kids are able to get the language involved with this. Next is guided practice. And this is something that's very, very important, is that, that students are not just practicing independently. And if you rush kids to this idea of practicing independently, often what happens is they're practicing it wrong. And when they practice it wrong, they're learning it wrong, and that's going to be more of a challenge. But guided practice must be actively supervised by the teacher. There needs to be interaction. There needs to be questioning. And the questioning needs to go far beyond did you get the right answer or did you not get the right answer. It needs to get into the process of how you got through that point. And this is also very important. It's okay, math teachers, I'm telling you, it's okay that when you get to guided practice, you realize that you need to go back and do more instruction on the content. And this is the prime area to see this. If you see multiple students uh, struggling, this is a time where maybe you pull them aside, you do some small group instruction, that often some is referred to as differentiated instruction, but this is a time where you need to try to sort of catch the kids before they get in and, and it becomes a pattern of learning something incorrectly. Next is this idea of feedback and correctives. We've known for quite some time that, that corrective feedback is critical. And within the area of math, we must understand that making errors uh, is okay. It's part of the learning process. But what the teacher must recognize is that those errors must not go uncorrected. It is once kids make a mistake, allowing them to try to figure it out, and what happens is they end up guessing. And when they're guessing, that's defeating the whole purpose. So when errors occur, there should be immediate correction provided to the students. And of course, this has implications for homework. If kids are doing 10 or 15 problems with absolutely no feedback, and they could be doing it wrong, then they're learning it wrong. So they need to, with explicit instruction, there's a high level of feedback and correctives provided. Now, when you get to the independent practice, this is often deemed as, for, for, for math teachers, as homework. And math teachers, we need to take a look very carefully at our homework practices and how we do independent practice. Kids should not get into independent practice until they are performing at a high level of accuracy. And that independent practice really is a way to build proficiency versus learning accuracy and content. So be very careful about how much homework you assign and that your independent problems that kids are given require little additional instruction. Many kids are not going to be able to get help outside of school in relationship to math. So it's very important that independent practice is focused, it's very clear, and it's addressing the, the, the skill or the concept that you want the students to become proficient with. 
The last area is something that is very, very important in the area of math, and this is sort of weekly and monthly reviews. And, you know, I sort of like to use this example that if I were to put up a calculus problem on the board right now, there's three things that I can guarantee you, all of you watching this at home. Number one, at some point, someone taught me how to do that calculus problem. At some point, I was able to do that calculus problem. But right now, I could not do that calculus problem. And it's not because I haven't learned it or it's sort of mysteriously vanished. It's because I haven't done it in, in a, any long period of time and that you must revisit through weekly and monthly reviews very important big ideas. Now this is where the, the content knowledge and the expertise of the teacher must come into play in the sense that you can't review everything because you'll never get to teaching new things. So there's certain things in math that are much more important than others that need to be reviewed on a consistent basis. These reviews should be distributed. They should not be 30 problems on a worksheet. And the last thing I want to point out, as you can see that last bullet here, is that oftentimes they need to be partnered with instruction. And practice isn't going to teach a child. Instruction must sometimes be partnered with these reviews. So with that being said, there were six characteristics or components of effective instru explicit instruction. Some considerations that take into place. This idea of providing explicit instruction it could be or is oftentimes new to some teachers. We're not used to doing that approach. And anytime you're not used to doing something, it becomes a little uncomfortable. So you need to have some, you know, plan in some planning, some professional development along these lines. Again, the National Mathematics Advisory Panel ha has made recommendations that we need to provide explicit instruction to these low achieving kids on a regular basis. So that sort of concludes this on explicit instruction. The slides are available on the Georgia Department of Education website. We'll go into a little bit more detail and uh, they'll be available for you to download.